Good evening. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. And without objection, I would ask that we suspend the rules to provide this city council meeting be held via video and telephone conference in accordance with Governor Whitmer's executive order 2020-75. And that participation of no less than four council members on this conference call constitutes a quorum for purposes of conducting this meeting pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. Additionally, comments tonight on tonight's public hearing will be provided via Zoom telephone conference at the following telephone number, 929-205-6099. When prompted, residents should enter the following meeting number, 4411997. And press pound. I'll repeat that number at the time of the public hearing. You do not need to enter a passcode. As with our prior Zoom video conference meetings, I would ask public comment be germane, pub, public comment germane to any other agenda item or to city business be provided via Zoom teleconference during communications from citizens at the same telephone, telephone number. <clears throat> Excuse me. Procedurally, in order to facilitate an orderly meeting by video and teleconference, I ask that if any of my colleagues want the floor to make or second a motion, please unmute yourself and ask for the floor. This will allow me to identify you. In case two council members speak over one another, I will make the final call. Also, council members are reminded to have their devices on mute when not talking to limit interference and refrain from watching the meeting online due to the slight delay in the broadcast. All of the votes of the city council tonight will be by roll call vote conducted by the city clerk. Is there any objection to proceeding in the manner that I've outlined tonight? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the Pledge of, the, Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation. I will recite the Pledge of Allegiance so everyone can hear it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Riska, will you please proceed by reciting the invocation? Dear God, please bless our elected officials, grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens, amen. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Council, we need approval of the agenda tonight. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Kosky. Move to approve the agenda. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko. Support. Motion to approve the agenda. It's been moved and supported. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Kosky. Participating. Mr. Radke. Participating. Mrs. Schmidt. Participating. Mrs. Sarasky. Participating. Mayor Taylor. Uh, participating. Mr. Yanez. Participating. And Mrs. Yarko. Participating. Let me um, pull Mr. Kashupski in because I, I've already made a mistake. My first mistake in a very long time. So I think I'm <laughs> um, So I skipped over the roll call, but everybody seemed to do the roll call, right? Um, I, I went right to the approval of the agenda. And so I asked for a motion to approve the agenda and it was moved and supported and we uh, proceeded to vote by saying participating. Help me out of the mess I created, Mr. Kashubsky. Sure, you could just have Ms. Riska do the roll call now, either way. Um, we know everybody's there because we went through the roll call for the vote. Minus one. Sure. I, and I saw Ms. Riska, so I'm like, what are you doing? I should have stopped then. Okay, uh, Ms. Riska, can we please have the roll call? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Participating. Mrs. Sarasky? Participating. Mrs. Kosky? Participating. Mr. Radke? Participating. Mrs. Schmidt? Participating. Mr. Yanez? Participating. Mrs. Yarko. Participating. Okay, thank you, Ms. Uh, Risco. 
Uh, I'm going to go through the approval of the agenda one more time, so just so we have a clean vote. So, uh, Ms. Koski, uh, please proceed. Move to approve the agenda. Support. Ms. Zarco. Support. It's been moved and it's been moved and supported, uh, with no discussion. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Koski. Yes. Mr. Radke. Yes. Mrs. Schmidt. Yes. Mrs. Sarosky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. And Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, the agenda is approved. Next item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool, get us back on track. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor. As I've done in the past, I would like to begin by sharing an update with some of our COVID-19 stats that's tracked by the county. And then I wanna move into our reopening plans and then report back to city council on a couple of charter issues. So let me begin by bringing up a few slides for everyone. Okay. So first of all, uh, the good news is that our COVID uh, stats are, are looking uh, very good. We're trending in the right direction. As you see uh, the cases up in the top left-hand corner, uh, those are trending downward nicely. And of course the uh, death rate in Sterling Heights is uh, decreased as well. The last few days, uh, we have had zero deaths reported in Sterling Heights. So again, when you look down below, at, at the trend lines, uh, we're moving in, in the right direction. So uh, clearly uh, this is what we need to see uh, to begin reopening of not only the community, but also all of our city facilities, which I'm gonna talk about uh, briefly. Uh, this chart, if I can draw your attention to the bottom portion, as I've shown in the past, when you look at the cases as a percentage of population, uh, we're still kind of, uh, a little lower in the pack on um, both the number of cases as a percentage of population and deaths as a percentage of population. Uh, so for, what it, for whatever it's worth, I thought that the data continues to be uh, interesting. So with all that in mind, we're focusing our attention on the city's reopening plan. And some of this has been reported in the media so far, uh, but let me just summarize the key points of it. Uh, first of all, the Governor's current uh, stay at home order expires at midnight on May 28th. So that means uh, facilities uh, can begin to reopen under a sort of restricted manner, which the governor's been uh, outlining in new executive orders. Uh, and assuming that she does the same thing she's done with uh, the UP and the uh, Northern uh, Michigan, uh, we believe our plan is, is well within her guidelines. So our plan consists of 25% occupancy at our city facilities. And that includes uh, both uh, employees and visitors to our facilities. So you can see that alone is very restrictive. And we really have to do that to maintain uh, social distancing, which is absolutely critical. Uh, visitors will be required to wear masks and when we uh, focus on City Hall, uh, we can only allow 10 visitors at a time in the City Hall. If we have more than that, visitors will be assigned pagers and uh, we will page them from their vehicles or outside if it's a nice day. And then they can come in and, and proceed to the appropriate counter in which they uh, desire to conduct business. Uh, so it's, it's nicely organized. We'll have monitors at the front door to monitor everything and I expect it'll go uh, quite smooth. Our city employees will go through daily health screenings uh, and that will be completely automated. There's an app that they will have on their smartphone devices or their uh, iPads and tablets and the like. And they can go through the health assessment either at home as they're coming into the building and so on. They'll have temperature strips uh, to report their temperature and this will be a, a daily occurrence. And we've, we thought the automated process was uh, highly important for a number of reasons. First, it's very efficient. 
Now, secondly, it hel helps us with contact uh, tracing if there's uh, any problems that we may encounter with someone being exposed to COVID-19 or actually uh, testing positively for it. Uh, we have gone through a number of testing procedures with our employees. We're gonna have more next week. And we're also gonna have the ability to test employees at the Care Here facility in City Hall uh, should any one of them become symptomatic at any time. All employees will be provided with a personal protection equipment. Um, in addition, uh, visitors who come, by the way, and do not have a mask, we will provide masks for them. Uh, visitors who come to City Hall once we open and our other city facilities will notice a plexiglass screening at all of the counters and uh, sneeze guards, if you will, at other devices around all of our copiers and so on. You'll also notice uh, many wall-mounted and freestanding hand sanitizer stations uh, that can be used by visitors and employees throughout the day. Uh, our cleaning crew will continue to do their routine cleaning. On the weekends, they'll do deep cleanings of our city facilities. And then throughout the day, they'll be uh, wiping down surfaces, uh, handles, door, doorknobs, and the like. We're also installing devices on our interior doors that are open to the public, say restrooms, for example, uh, where you have arm uh, guards or, or um, latches that you can pull on with your forearm and you don't have to actually touch uh, the handle. So uh, although it's going to be very restrictive coming into uh, our city facilities, we wanted to remind residents and visitors, businesses and the like, uh, that we have a new campaign underway. We've been promoting this uh, uh, regularly throughout the last couple of months, especially the last couple of weeks. It's called No Shirt, No Shoes, No Problem. And these are all the at-home services that you can um, uh, access from your living room, your home offices, your businesses, and the like. And before you, it's just a sampling of all the services that you can do uh, remotely under this program. Um, so we know it's difficult to come to our facilities now. We want to get open. We want to service residents. Uh, but for those of you who are, who are more inclined to do things uh, electronically, you have many options at your disposal. And even beyond that program, uh, this crisis has been really the breeding ground for all sorts of innovations and, and um, a lot of ingenuity from our employees and, and others. And, and this program is just one of them. Uh, we have now rolled out virtual inspections. Uh, so for those who might not be able to uh, schedule a, a actual visit with a, an inspector or they simply feel uncomfortable maybe doing that, uh, you can do it virtually. And we now have uh, many programs that you can see here, shed and shed concrete inspections, deck post hole inspections, roof inspections, sign inspections, and the list goes on and on. Uh, so these inspections are done via Facebook and Zoom and I'm sure we'll be adding some other uh, options to the list as well. So here again, uh, this is an example of uh, uh, how you can continue to do business without actually having, come, having to come to our facilities. So if you have any questions on, on our at-home services, uh, you can uh, type in this address in the forward slash at-home services or uh, schedule inspections. And that'll take you right to the website where you can uh, do all of this. But if you don't wanna do that, we look forward to seeing you in our facilities beginning on, uh, it would be Wednesday, uh, June 3rd. So our employees will report to City Hall or to the city facilities on Friday the 29th. It'll take a couple of days to get acclimated and then we'll be open to the public on June 2nd. Now I say all of this with the qualification that it's conceivable that the governor does not allow offices to open on, on uh, May 29th. We fall under the office, office category, uh, governmental services. And it may take a little longer for Wayne County, Oakland County and Macomb County. But as it stands right now, uh, that is the schedule. So uh, moving on to the next item on my report, uh, the city council at the last meeting requested uh, some information regarding 
our charter requirement as it relates to signature requirements to get on a city council. Whether you're an incumbent or a new person uh, running for city council, you're subject to this charter requirement that uh, requires that um, each candidate file petitions of candidacy with the clerk containing signatures of a minimum of 1% and no more than 4% of the total registered voters of the city. There were 86,200 registered voters in 2019. So that means the city council uh, incumbents and any uh, challengers would have to get 862 verified signatures, meaning you'd want to submit more than that, but it can't be more than 4%. Uh, so that is a high threshold and city council expressed some concern about that, especially in this uh, time of a pandemic that that probably won't be subsiding anytime soon, even though the election is not this November, but would be uh, following year. So how do we rank with others? Uh, there's no doubt that Sterling Heights has a high threshold when you look at some of our comparable communities. And we provided a list of even more in, in our written material. Uh, but you can see here, uh, for example, uh, Troy, has a very low threshold of 60 signatures, Farmington Hills, 200 signatures, uh, Southfield, uh, uh, well, more than 200 signatures. So uh, when you look at those comparable cities, uh, Sterling Heights ranks quite high in terms of our requirement. Then there's also the uh, threshold that the state of Michigan has. So if you do not have a charter requirement, uh, then you default to the state statute requiring a requirement of no less than 600 and no more than 1,000. So our requirement's a little more in line uh, with the state requirement, which is applicable to many communities uh, across the state of Michigan. So what are the options for city council? Well, before you are three uh, rather obvious options, you know, there's some different uh, machinations from each one of these options, but uh, let me just summarize them. Uh, so first, you could amend the city charter through a vote of the people, that is, uh, to be consistent with the, um, the state threshold uh, or to use the state system. Uh, and that would require um, 600 signatures. So you'd have a reduction of 262 signatures required from the current charter provision. Another option would be to simply reduce our 1% in half, which would take the required signatures down to 431. And the third option would be to just set a fixed number. Either option two or option three would have very little variation. Uh, so there really isn't a big difference there. Uh, so those are the options before you. Um, the timeline, if council was desirous in proceeding with this charter change, to put it on the uh, November uh, presidential ballot to let the voters decide, uh, we would need some direction starting this, uh, this evening and certainly uh, no later than the June 2nd city council meeting, which would then give us some time to prepare a resolution of the proposed ballot language at your June 16th meeting. And then historically what we've done, although not required, is submit the uh, proposed amendment to the governor's office and attorney general for a preview. We've found this to be very advantageous because if you wait to the last minute to go through this process, there could be some hiccups in, in both the governor's review and the attorney general's review. And we wanna avoid that at all costs if, there's, if we're moving forward with this. So we've historically done it. We have a very good working relationship with the staff in the governor's office who reviews these amendments. So uh, we feel pretty good about uh, the process. So the ballot wording would need to then be approved by the governor and the attorney general, and then must be certified by the city clerk and the Macomb County clerk uh, on August 4th. Uh, so that is a rough uh, outline of the critical dates. There's a few other dates in the timeline, but these are the most noteworthy. So with that charter, um, potential charter amendment in mind, and in the spirit of, of trying to um, make decisions that, that maybe best position us to handle 
a climate of uh, pandemic uh, uh, challenges moving forward. I mean, we hope that there's a vaccine for COVID-19, but who knows what the next pandemic may be or how long this may, may go. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I wanted to raise this issue because the city council a while back uh, requested that we do some research on this. And that is the term uh, for city council and the mayor uh, positions. Right now, as everyone knows, we have non-staggered two-year terms. And when we looked at the data across the country, it's clear to see that we are in the minority of uh, uh, communities uh, that most, if you look here, 92% uh, based on a sampling nationwide have four-year terms for city council and almost 80% uh, for the position of mayor. And so it's easy to conclude that that is a best practice for a number of reasons, uh, which I'll uh, touch base on a little later in the presentation. So when we uh, drill down, or I should say, when we expand it even further, and we don't just look at our size population communities, and we look at all cities nationwide, uh, you can see that the two-year term um, model is, is again, a minority model, the vast majority of communities, regardless of size nationwide, uh, have four-year terms. And when we uh, drill down to Michigan cities, you can see the same thing. Uh, interesting uh, to, to note here, uh, the city council members are, um, and, and mayor are well beyond um, uh, two-year terms for the vast majority of communities in Michigan and the same for Macomb County cities. Uh, so I thought the uh, empirical data was very interesting and certainly makes a, a compelling argument toward a best practice, which we currently are not uh, practicing. So uh, why, why would four-year terms be considered a best practice? Well, uh, probably maybe first and foremost, uh, they do save money. Uh, having elections, two-year elections, cost money, 75000 approximately per election. And if primaries are needed, you can double that amount. Um, so obviously, cost savings is, is a primary factor when you're looking at it as a best practice. Changing uh, city council elections to four-year terms would obviously be consistent with these practices and aligned with cities, not only in Michigan, but nationwide. And cities that have four-year terms and have them in large part for consistency purposes and continuity purposes beyond cost savings. Uh, because as we well all know, uh, most community projects in cities take a long time to accomplish. You know, we're not talking about two years in most cases. Uh, Mound Road, we've been planning for, you know, many years. When we look at our master plans, they go out five years. When we look at other plans, they, they go longer than that. When we look at development projects, they, they sometimes go um, you know, five, six, 10 years in some cases. Uh, now that hasn't necessarily been a problem for continuity purposes, but it could be a problem with uh, turnover in uh, two-year cycles. Four-year terms uh, enable city council members to devote more of their time to city initiatives, projects, rather than having to focus on re-election campaigning every other year, uh, which is obviously very time consuming for incumbents and, and uh, those uh, uh, running for city council too. And four-year terms may afford challengers more time to better prepare for an election, enhancing the democratic process uh, as well, to be fair. So then the question becomes, uh, well, what is the best practice with respect to staggered terms versus non-staggered terms? And here the, the, the nationwide data shows a little bit more of a, a split. Uh, but the reality is we currently have non-staggered terms in uh, Sterling Heights and stag moving to staggered terms uh, may cause confusion, uh, knowing that the longstanding practice has been non-staggered. In staggered terms would negate the savings that would result from four-year terms. Staggered terms may necessitate a two-year term for mayor 
And this would avoid disparity in lower voter turnout for the three council members that would run in off years when the mayor is not up for election. So typically mayoral elections have a larger voter turnout when you look at data nationwide, which may benefit the three council members or candidates running at the same time as the mayor. So if you had a two year term for mayor, that too uh, would negate the savings and would result in potential confusion. So when we look at this issue, uh, we would strongly urge the council if you're uh, going to consider this uh, best practice that you consider uh, continuing with the non-staggered term uh, model. Now in terms of, uh, well, let me, let me just continue on here. Um, the timeline would be very similar, it would be identical to the timeline for the signature requirement that we discussed earlier. Um, so knowing that both these items are time sensitive, we would appreciate getting some uh, beginning of direction this evening, definitely solidified on, on the June 2nd meeting for potential formal action by city council at your June 16th city council meeting. Um, so I will stop there, Mayor, but I do have one last item. And that is at the conclusion of tonight's meeting, I'm requesting that the city council convene a closed session pursuant to section 8E of the Open Meetings Act to consult with the city attorney regarding legal strategy in connection with the city's pending litigation in Macomb County Circuit Court case number 2017-0001. S and Mayor, that concludes my report this evening. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Vanderpool for that report. Move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is a public hearing. As I said at the beginning of this meeting, I'm going to uh, give anybody who's watching the meeting at home or online uh, the phone number to dial in again, uh, just so that you have it. Phone number is 929-205. 6099 and the code to enter is 44119975. This agenda item is a public hearing to consider approval of a first amendment to consent judgment in the case Orly et al. v. City of Sterling Heights, Macomb County Circuit Court, case numbers 86 4245 CE and 89 4043 CE involving property commonly known as 2260 18 Mile Road. We have a presentation from our city planner, Chris McLeod. Mr. McLeod, are you there? I am, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, thank Mayor and, and rest of council. Uh, let me sh share my screen here with you and go through a quick presentation regarding uh, this proposed first amendment uh, to the consent judgment for 2260 uh, 18 Mile Road. Uh, so moving on to slide, slide two. Um, so realistically, this would be that first amendment to a consent judgment that was entered in all the way back in 1996, uh, which originally allowed this portion of the property uh, to be utilized specifically as a supermarket, but also if not to be utilized as a supermarket uh, for uses that were consistent with our C1 local business uh, district uses. Um, this property is also part, this consent is also much larger than this takes on uh, additional residential properties around it, but we're only dealing specifically with what was formerly the Kroger piece uh, for tonight's purposes. Uh, the property is currently zoned R70, uh, one family residential. If that sounds a little confusing, uh, it probably is, but um, the consent judgment does dictate what happens with this property as all consent judgments do. Uh, the consent judgment, again, that does allow for this supermarket and the C1 uses. Again, neither one of the uses being proposed tonight that we'll get into, which is an indoor self-storage facility for the actual Kroger building, uh, former Kroger building, or the Walgreens, which is proposed in essentially what would be an outlot of the parking lot. Um, neither one of those is permissible under the current consent judgment terms. Uh, and that's why this is before you in, at council level at this point. Uh, so in terms of the, moving on to slide three, this kind of shows uh, the existing uh, zoning configuration of the surrounding properties. So directly to the north where the new Kroger is located, uh, that property was rezoned C3 for the most part uh, as a conditional rezoning. Uh, the two uh, 
financial institutions that are there remain C2. Uh, so to the north, we have a much more intense zoning configuration. Uh, the gas station at the southeast corner of 18 in Quinder is zone C3. There's a myriad of other zonings of O1, uh, which was also done as a consent judgment, C1, uh, and then some multiple family as well. To the east and to the south is, is our 70. Uh, one family residential. So there really is a mix of, of different zoning classifications in this area. And the property to the east, albeit uh, zoned uh, for single family purposes, is part of this consent judgment and is allowed or was allowed to be developed for multiple family purposes. Uh, so the master land use plan calls for this area to be essentially local commercial. Um, so the proposed uses are somewhat outside of the direct terms or the direct intent of the master plan. But looking at how the building is configured and the setup of, of, of the overall land use in the area, um, a more intensive use could be considered at this site. Um, and that's why, again, this is before you tonight and it's made it to this point. This kind of shows an aerial uh, photography of, of, the, of the Kroger site itself and the surrounding area and kind of the land use pattern showing the residential again to the south and to the east. Uh, again, the Kroger facility that's going to become the Cube Smart, and we'll get into the uses here on the next couple of slides, but um, that footprint is not proposed to expand at all. Uh, so what you see there is its relationship to the surrounding residential properties will not be impacted. Uh, the Walgreens, which is proposed again in the outlot, will be directly abutting or directly facing the McDonald's, if you're familiar with the site. Uh, so the westernmost drive that comes in off of 18 Mile Road uh, it will be the direct access for that Walgreens. So the Walgreens itself, again, if, per, if approved, would not have any immediate impact uh, to the surrounding residents. It will be right along the roadway. Uh, so any potential nuisances should be mitigated by the time it reaches the residential to the south or to the east. Slide six kind of shows the overall concept, uh, showing where these buildings are located. Again, the, the existing building, the, the footprint does not change. Uh, besides the fact that they're gonna improve the facade and make some minor adjustments to the building in terms of uh, fixes to it. And then you can see the proposed Walgreens again in the Northwest corner of this subject site. And this is the concept plan of the way this lays out. This kind of gets into a little bit more detailed plan, also overlays the landscaping. Uh, so in this particular instance, uh, the landscaped islands that are throughout the parking lot will all be enhanced. There'll be some additional landscaping along the building front uh, at the entrance to the Northwest corner of uh, the Cube Smart building, and then landscaping will also be enhanced along the 18 mile road frontage, along the entire frontage. Uh, there is a separate landscape plan for the Walgreens that we'll get into shortly. Uh, but again, the, the point of this plan being is that the Cube Smart facility will not expand the actual footprint of the building, bringing it no closer to residences, uh, not having for any more intensity of use, uh, moving in one direction or another, uh, simply. Um, using the building as is with a, with a refresh of the facade, if you will. And, that, and this is on slide eight, the refresh of the building. So basically the entrances uh, would receive some enhancements with brick and additional uh, metal materials, uh, providing a, a little bit more updated look. The remainder of the building would, would get a new paint scheme. Um, so the top, uh, top elevation is that which faces De Quinder. Uh, which is the most uh, not visible, if you will, uh, elevation. Uh, if you, again, if you're familiar with the site, that singular drive that comes in off of DeQuinder, uh, it's behind a, a multitude of buildings, so this facade won't, won't be the most visible. The facade to the bottom is the 18-mile road uh, frontage. Uh, again, basically the same facade that you see now. Let me flip back to slide seven. But with that landscaping in place, realistically, most of this building currently, as it stands today, as well as what's being proposed, will not be visible to the general public. So it, both buildings, both the Cube Smart building and the Walgreens building, for all intent and purposes, will not become visible until you enter into the site itself. Moving on to slide nine, um, basically just showing the, the gen general interior configuration of the indoor storage facility. Again, the highlight here is that the building remains, uh, the building footprint remains unchanged. Uh, and then this shows the, the layout of the different uh, unit sizes within the building being proposed. If you wanna talk that in terms of use of this, uh, they will have standard office hours. Uh, the building itself will be open to anyone who is a patron, who is a, a member of, of the, or has a unit within the building. They will have 24 uh, security uh, access to the building. Uh, but general public will only be allowed into the building during uh, 
essentially normal business hours. Uh, this gets into the landscape plan and the site plan for the Walgreens itself. Again, this is immediately across, and you can see it just to the far left-hand side of the site plan here, immediately across from the existing McDonald's. Uh, so again, any potential exterior um, abutting re residential properties are far to the south and far to the east, again, limiting the impact. Uh, again, this shows the fact that they're enhancing the landscape along uh, the 18-mile road frontage, landscaping throughout. As a new build site, this site does uh, meet and exceed uh, the city zoning ordinance requirements for landscaping and building materials, which we'll get into in one second. Um, and then obviously this use is a new concept for Walgreens. Uh, I don't believe there's actually been one built in Michigan yet. Uh, it is a, essentially a mainly a drive-through facility. It's a much smaller facility, as you can see, as even compared to, to the McDonald's there. This is a 2,500, about a 2,500 square foot building. Um, about a fifth or a sixth of the size of a, a normal Walgreens that we're used to. Normal Walgreens are about 12 or 13,000 square feet. Uh, but this is their new concept where it's primarily just drive through. You can go in, there will be uh, shopping available there, but it'll be very limited in terms of what you can purchase inside. This is mainly for prescription services. Uh, this shows uh, the exterior renditions uh, showing a, a multitude of bricks um, being utilized, uh, live green walls. Uh, those are the green elements that are on, on the facades there. Uh, metal canopies around most of the, the facades, and then that uh, weaved metal uh, paneling that's on the main uh, front of the building. So as we kind of go through these uh, to the top left-hand side is the west elevation, that is the Dequinder elevation. Uh, to the bottom right is the north elevation, that is what would be present itself, if you could see it from 18 Mile Road, uh, what would be presenting itself to 18 Mile Road. Again, the landscaping in this area is pretty thick. Uh, it's pretty, it, since the site has been around for the last 20 or 30 years, that landscaping has matured greatly and the vast majority of that landscaping will remain in place and also be enhanced further by the proposed development. This again shows the, uh, the floor plan of the actual uh, inside of the Walgreens. Again, very limited sales within the area there. The Walgreens will have standard uh, hours of 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. The drive-through is proposed to be open 24 hours, uh, but the actual in-service or in-store service would be limited hours of operation. This just provides some details in terms of the landscaping materials being proposed uh, throughout the uh, throughout the site uh, to give you a flavor of, of what's being being shown there. Uh, so again, kind of the request analysis. Uh, Again, the master plan does call for this area to be local commercial. However, the existing building um, and the location of this is kind of atypical for a C1 type use with this building size for the, uh, for the former Kroger proposed CubeSmart building. Um, again, C1 uses are more the quote unquote mom and pop stores, uh, which are much smaller in size. Uh, so unless this building was significantly um, subdivided, if you will, um, it wouldn't necessarily be conducive to the types of uses we'd normally be looking for there in a C1. Uh, the surrounding parcels are a mixture of uh, multiple family, single family office, um, albeit some of those office designations I alluded to before are under consent judgment. The McDonald's that's there is actually zoned office, but obviously it's not an office use. And then there's C3 uses at the corner and then obviously across the street. So there's some more intense land uses in this area. Uh, the proposed use of the existing building, the former Kroger. Um, realistically, these uses that are proposed for the indoor storage are much less intense than any normal retail type of use. I mean, the residents in that surrounding area are very used to having a very busy Kroger facility there, albeit not for the last couple months, but, um, but still leading up to that, Kroger is obviously a very successful brand there. Um, but typically, these types of indoor facilities probably get anywhere from 10 to 20, maybe 30 at the tops, um, people coming to them on a daily basis. So the traffic is very limited. Um, this does provide an adaptive reuse of a vacant building. Again, this is a unique building size for the C1 district. Um, there's not a lot of uses within our C1 district that would normally fill this type of building. And then again, I've, I've kind of stressed it throughout, but there's no expansion of the footprint uh, this building doesn't get any closer uh, to the surrounding land uses or the surrounding residences. There will be no outdoor storage allowed for this particular facility, so everything will be indoors. Um, the one modification to the interior, in addition to obviously splitting it up for um, the actual storage units, there will be a second floor interior to the building, but there'll be no additional height. The building is tall enough as it stands today to actually split it in half. 
uh, that I provide to you for it. And then the development of the drive-through uh, should again have minimal impact on the surrounding properties since it is so close to 18 mile road and then creates a more efficient use of under, otherwise underutilized property or parking lot. Again, one of the directives of the master plan is to try to um, further utilize the, the parking areas and the, some of the seas of asphalt that have been created in years past uh, where retail may not necessarily need it anymore. And that's particularly the case for these indoor storage facilities. Obviously their parking needs are very limited. Uh, so uh, providing additional building and additional use would help uh, activate the, uh, the overall property and the Walgreens is, is able to do that. So uh, with that, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions uh, that council may have at this point. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. McLeod. What we'll do is uh, ask the uh, petitioner if uh, they would like to make a presentation at this time, and then we'll come back to any questions that you might have uh, later. Um, there are a number of petitioners on the call with us. Um, and Chris, if you don't mind, could you mute yourself? Um, so I'm gonna go first to, uh, from Walgreens, uh, Mr. Brad DeVault. I'm going to unmute you, sir. And uh, do you have any presentation for the city council tonight? Um, I, I believe Jason is going to give a joint presentation for Walgreens and CubeSmart. Okay, thank so, you very um, we, much. I, I'm available here for questions as well as a uh, Walgreens representative, but uh, Jason is going to lead kind of the, the joint presentation. You got it. Okay, I'm going to put you back on mute and I'll get to Jason. Uh, Jason Canvasser, I am going to unmute you. Uh, Mr. Canvasser, any presentation tonight? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, Jason Canvasser of the Clark Hill Law Firm, 500 Woodward Avenue, Suite 3500, Detroit, Michigan. Um, first and foremost, let me thank everybody for the effort and time that's been put into this um, project. And I'm going to speak a little bit on behalf of, of both um, proposals, but I think Mr. McLeod did a really, really good job laying everything out. So I don't want to waste anybody's time rehashing things that he's already said. Um, I'm gonna start with the deal point CubeSmart uh, self-storage facility. Um, and like, like Mr. McLeod said, this is converting the existing Kroger building to self-storage. Um, we are not changing the footprint, we're improving the facade, um, adding some landscaping. Um, and, the research that's been done indicates that there is a substantial need for self-storage in the area. Um, the national average for self-storage is about seven square feet per person. Um, right now, within a one mile radius of this location, there is zero square footage. Um, if you expand that to two miles, there's still zero square footage. You have to go out to three miles before you start getting to any self-storage locations, and you're only at 4.73 um, square feet per person within three miles. So this is a very drastically underserved area. Um, and this business model has historically been very stable with, I think, um, occupancies around 85%. And um, with, for better or for worse, we think the COVID pandemic may only strengthen this business model of people uh, for a variety of reasons needing to, to store things. But uh, we certainly don't think there'll be a negative impact by the COVID pandemic. Um, the the CubeSmart business is, we anticipate is gonna have a very low impact area, certainly much, much lower than the Kroger had on the site. Um, we would actually anticipate somewhere between 10 and 15 customers per day with three to four employees maybe at a given time or per day. So we're not talking about a lot of cars. We're talking about less than 20 cars at the site per day. Um, and the building will be highly secured. There'll be security cameras, there'll be surveillance. Um, most of the visitors are anticipated to come during business hours. Um, there will be security measures for those needing to access their units after hours uh, via security codes and the cameras will still be monitoring the premises in case anything is necessary. 
Um, but in terms of noise, pollution, utility, um, this will drastically decrease what was what, what residents were used to from uh, the Kroger's usage. In regards to the Walgreens proposal, uh, right across to Quinder, there is currently an existing Walgreens. It's, it's about a 14,000 square foot building. Um, and that building serves roughly about 100 customers per day in terms of filling prescriptions. It fill about 150 scripts per day for about 100 customers. Um, the plans, Walgreens plans are to close that building. Um, it's, it's simply a, a too big of a footprint and they're going to a smaller model. Um, and that seems to be the way of a lot of businesses, uh, not only in the pharmaceutical industry, but across a number of, of industries going to smaller footprints and getting rid of these big box stores. Um, Walgreens though doesn't want to abandon its customers. Um, it's had a long relationship with these customers and wants to make sure it's continuing to provide uh, the services that these customers need, especially at this time, uh, they want to make sure they're filling those scripts and making sure uh, their customers have a place to go. So what they're proposing is this smaller, uh, about 2,500 square foot building uh, in the outlot, and they'll still be able to maintain the, the same level of service to fill those prescriptions. What won't be at this new building is the front end, most of the front end stuff, the greeting cards and um, some of the convenience items. There'll still be uh, some items, some candy bars and some other things like that, but the greeting cards and uh, certain other items will no longer be available. Um, and drugstores are allowed as a C1 usage. What, what isn't allowed is the drive through element here. Um, and typically Walgreens have drive throughs In fact, the one across the street does have a drive through um, Walgreens, the typical Walgreens drive through accounts for about 30% of their business. And this may have slightly higher, but we don't expect it to be drastically different. Um, but even during peak hours, talking 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, we don't expect to see anywhere near the volume of cars that may be at uh, McDonald's, for example, right nearby. I think we'll see approximately four to five cars at, at, the, at the busiest point lined up, and usually it'll be a lot um, quicker. And it's important to have that drive-through element, especially, um, well, especially now with, with the COVID pandemic and not knowing how long that's going to last uh, with it, so that there can be a minimal uh, of, of the face-to-face -face interaction. But even when we go back to normal, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later, um, drive-throughs are, are an integral part of Walgreens or really any pharmaceutical business. Um, they serve an important part, uh, they, they serve an important purpose for the elderly, for parents with kids in their cars, um, especially during those cold winter months and those rainy days so that the elderly parents ha don't have to drag themselves and their young kids into the store to pick up a prescription. Um, personally, as a father of some young kids, having a 24 hour uh, pharmacy is, is great for, for me. And I know a lot of other people when your child gets sick in the middle of the night and you need to get that prescription. So, um, you know, that, that's an important business model to make sure that those time sensitive prescriptions can, can get to the customers at any point in the day. Um, so we ask that you approve the amended consent judgment. Um, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions um, that you may have. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Canvasser, and uh, I believe we have Mr. Frank on the line, David Frank, but uh, Mr. Canvasser, is, is that going to suffice for the presentation tonight? Yeah, you're correct. I do have David Frank on the phone from uh, on behalf of Cube Smart, and uh, we already heard from Brad briefly. So if, if council has any technical questions, I may ask that they jump in, um, but otherwise, why don't we see what I can do? 
Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you back on mute because we're going to uh, go open the public hearing and allow for the public to participate. Then once the council makes a motion and starts deliberating, they may have questions for one or, or more of you. And at that point, I'll, I'll get you back off mute. All right. All right, that's, that, I appreciate that. And I would just ask that to the extent there are any comments that I might be able to address it, I'd be asked, uh, you know, able to do so. Okay, yes, yeah, so hang tight. Don't uh, drop off the call. We'll put you on mute and we'll be back to you shortly. All right, at this point, I would like to open the public hearing. Uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, we're receiving public comments during this uh, public hearing via telephone conference tonight. Uh, so those members of the public on the phone that wish to participate in the public hearing will be recognized in turn, um, and uh, they they can uh, they can that person if that they will be recognized in turn if they have a comment. All other members of the public will continue to be muted uh, until called upon. If you wish to participate in the public hearing, which is right now, please press star nine on your telephone. By pressing star nine on your telephone, it will notify me. I'll see it as a raised hand, and uh, I'll take that as your desire to speak. When prompted, uh, state your name, and I'll allow you to address the city council, and uh, please be advised that there could be delays based on the number of calls received. Um, you'll be afforded the regular amount of time, which is four minutes, to address the city council. So I'm going to just ask one last time. We do have a number of guests on the call tonight, um, and I see that we have a raised hand. So just bear with me one moment. So I'm going to go to the caller ending in 2045. Caller 2045, you're unmuted and uh, you have the floor. Please announce your name. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is David Habib. I live uh, right near Imus Park. And uh, first, just um, in general, um, you know, want to say, you know, you guys do a great job. All right, I've been in Sterling Heights my whole life. I grew up in here and I, now I have my own family bringing them up. And so, um, so really, uh, really love being here. And my uh, question, a couple of questions, and then maybe just a comment if there's any time left. But my question was for the, the reopening and uh, some of what Mr. Vanderpool was so going through. So David, well, I'm gonna cut you off and, I, and I'm sorry to do that. So we are on the uh, public hearing for the consent judgment and there will be an opportunity for uh, public comment on, on any item of your choosing, but that's not this portion of the agenda. So right now we're only taking comments and questions relating to this agenda item, the 18 mile road, uh, property that is formerly the Kroger. So, if you do you have any questions on this agenda item specifically? No, no, I know. I'm sorry. Nothing specific okay. to this agenda item. Okay, then just hang on the call, and we'll pull you back in uh, towards the end of the council meeting. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the floor back then. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, anyone else on this agenda item? If so, please uh, I'll give you a moment to. Uh, press star nine to raise your hand. And again, just to be clear, we're, we're on this particular agenda item. Okay, seeing none, uh, council, uh, we will need a motion. Um, is there a motion on this item? Mayor Taylor. Uh, Mrs. Zarco, please proceed. Okay. Um, resolved to approve the first amendment to the consent judgment for entry in the case orally um, versus City of Sterling Heights, Macomb County Circuit Court case numbers 86-4245-CE and 89-4043-CE and authorize the mayor and the city clerk to sign all documents required in conjunction with this approval. Thank you, Councilwoman Zarco. Uh, Council, do we have a second? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt, do you second the motion? I second the motion been moved and supported. Is there any uh, discussion, Ms. Zarco? You know, I think that uh, Mr. McLeod certainly explained everything. And also, um, uh, some of the questions that I had were actually um, answered in the uh, presentation. And one of them was the status of the 
other uh, Walgreens that are in the area. And that was answered for me. So um, I see no reason why um, we couldn't move forward with, forward with this. It's a uh, good use of the area. And certainly um, we're always glad to have some kind of redevelopment. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, worthy of uh, approval. Nothing further. Okay, thank you, Ms. Zarco. Uh, Ms. Schmidt? Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I would like to thank the petitioners, actually. This is a, a very quick turnaround for what could have been a very long time of having an empty Kroger building in our, in our city. Um, from past experience, we know some of the Farmer Jacks stayed empty for years. So um, I, I believe these two uses are actually less intense um, as the petitioner had mentioned. Um, and I can't imagine putting any residential properties there, which it's is, is zoned right now. So um, I'm really pleased and, uh, and uh, that's really, I'm in full support of the motion. I, I'm excited that uh, they are taking up an empty building and very quickly. So that is, I have nothing further. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Uh, Council, anyone else? Uh, Mayor Taylor? Uh, Ms. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sorowski. Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Through, through the chair to the, although I really do love that we're going to be using the CubeSmart, I wanted to thank also the Walgreens developer and, and personnel because we initially did not really like the way the facade was looking and you guys did a great job of altering it to our requests. And so thank you, because that, that made all the difference to us. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sorowski. Anyone else, Council? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Mr. McLeod, um, looking at this uh, plan in front of me, the master plan says so this is supposed to be a local convenience district. Is it cube smart? fit inside of a local convenience district? Is that is a storage facility normally put in a local convenience district? Mr. McLeod, please make sure to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Rad or Councilperson Radke, to, to answer that directly, in, a, in most cases, no. And that's why it's in front of you. If it was a use that fit into a C1 district, uh, they could have went in there as of right under the current consent judgment. Um, so with any consent judgment, uh, you deal with the uses that are brought forward to you um, and you determine whether that use is appropriate for that particular area. Um, so in this particular instance, as I indicated, this building is not your, your typical C1 type of building. Um, so when my envisionment is when the, when the consent judgment was originally done, um, while they, the specific use being proposed was for a supermarket, the city wanted to protect itself moving forward and put a very limiting use of the C1 uh, in place. So that therefore any future uses um, would either be very limited in scope or they would be coming back in front of you much like this one is uh, to ask for permission to do something more intensive. So I think you know the, the, the foresight of the, the council's prior when this consent was originally done was to protect itself moving forward. And you know, so on this particular case, you have the determination as to whether or not in this particular instance, uh, the use of this building as being proposed, this non-traditional C1 type building being proposed um, or use being proposed is, is conducive to this particular area. And you know, I think you take into account what the outside um, impacts would be for this and be very limited. Um, albeit it's not a traditional C1 type use. So um, with that being said, I, I think, you know, in this particular instance, an exception can be made. I know that we have a, uh, a, a nodes plan that's gonna come before us in the future that you've been working on for quite some time. In that nodes plan, how does, it, how does this area, the C1 district here, figure into that plan? Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this particular area is not included in one of the specific nodes outlined in the master plan. Uh, there are 11 of those particular areas throughout the city. Uh, this particular area was not deemed as one of those. Um, 
albeit you know that 18 in DeQuinder is a relatively large intersection. Um, it is not the biggest intersection, so to speak. I mean, so, and the, the land uses that are currently within there and the way that they're configured, uh, the master plan did not envision this area ultimately being one of those traditional nodes. Um, so the, the plan that is coming forward, the zoning amendments coming forward would not impact this particular property or this particular intersection. I guess I just have uh, concerns about this. We already have several storage facilities in the city. We've been approving them at a feverish rate in the last year. I want to say we approved four, if I can remember that quickly. I know we approved several. And this is just one more example, but it doesn't really add anything to the local neighborhood. It, it's a passive use. The Walgreens is basically going down from a full service facility to basically a drive-through facility. It's also not really a use. I just don't think it fits with the master plan. I, I guess I can, I don't blame Kroger for wanting to offload the property and they don't want to put a competitor in there and I can understand that. But at the same time, I just don't think this conforms with the master plan. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Radke, Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through the chair to a representative of Cube Smart. This is a storage unit um, available. Can you tell us how many units are going to be in there? And if you have some kind of guidelines or some direction as to people bringing things in, what are they allowed to store there? And what is your method of checking the items being brought in? Do you have, uh, what do I want to say, a, a receptionist type person when they bring their uh, things in for storage? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to uh, attorney canvasser, Mr. Canvasser, I'll let you answer that. And if uh, you wanted to def defer to one of your colleagues, let me know when I get that person unmuted. Yeah, um, I would note that I think it was slide number one from Mr. McLeod's present, I'm sorry, slide number nine from Mr. McLeod's presentation has the floor layout. That would be level one plan. So um, I defer to Mr. Frank in terms of the mechanics, but um, I, I guess I would also note that, you know, no hazardous materials or anything flammable. There's, a, there's a, some specific language included in the consent judgment to preclude some of those hazardous materials to be included as um, as being prohibited from storage. But in terms of how they check the items and the exact number of units, I'd have to defer to Mr. Uh, Frank. All right, uh, Mr. Frank, I'm uh, unmuting you. Do you have any uh, further response you'd like or clarification to add to that? Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, David Frank. Uh, CEO of Deal Point Merrill, address is 22815 Ventura Boulevard, Suite 310, Woodland Hills, California, 91364. Um, <clears throat> thank you again, uh, council members, for hearing our application this evening. Uh, Deal Point Merrill um, is a national firm that, uh, besides being uh, real, having a real estate arm, we also own uh, self-storage facilities all around the country. Uh, <clears throat> in reference to the councilwoman's uh, questions, uh, the plan that we currently have at this location, we uh, approximately, uh, the size units will range from approximately 10 by 10s. This will be offered to the public, 10 by 10 square feet, uh, 10 by 15, uh, uh, and uh, five by seven and a half. These are uh, typical sizes that uh, that are, are that are designed for the public. Um, as far as uh, the, the the type of customer, about 30% uh, of the of the building itself will be most likely used by businesses in the surrounding community. Uh, surrounding community, and the, about 70% will be for personal effects uh, by uh, various different residents in the nearby area. In so far as uh, hazardous materials, um, we have in our leases uh, uh, prohibition uh, with uh, guns, hazardous uh, substances, and whatnot. In so far as uh, uh, the office itself, we, we the office is manned, and uh, 
when the unit is uh, rented out, uh, there's a whole program by which a customer must agree to and uh, uh, abide by the rules and conditions of the, of the lease and the use of the, the, the storage unit itself. The, the units are typically on a month to month lease. And so, um, uh, and uh, as far as uh, inspections go, um, we, we are allowed in our lease to do random inspections uh, throughout the, the course of the, of, the, of the rental agreement. And um, so we do have a policy in place. We do have the ability to go into the units uh, as well. And I hope I answered your questions, Councilwoman, but I'm available for additional questions. Now that's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Koski. Council, is there uh, anyone else with any discussion on this item? Okay, hearing no uh, further discussion, uh, I just want to say that uh, I appreciate uh, the work that was done by our city administration and also by uh, the developer and all the parties involved here. Uh, it, it was, as mentioned, a quick turnaround. So we didn't have a vacant building there for very long and uh, some unique design elements in the Cube Smart. And um, I certainly uh, do, do believe that this is something I mean, Mr. Radke has, has mentioned that we have uh, approved a number of these, but I just think that shows that there's a strong market for them here. And uh, I think it's something that is, is not gonna be going away anytime soon. Um, you know, I hope for your sake that, uh, I'll tell you what, speaking with our trash hauler, we had something like 40 to 50% more volume. So I hope all that stuff that normally would be going into your storage unit wasn't thrown away as people are, are at home and not knowing what to do with their time. But I still think you're going to have a, a good business there. And I also want to uh, commend Walgreens uh, for what they're doing. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting uh, project and and I want to thank them for coming back to the city council with uh, a much more desirable uh, facade and elevation than than originally um, they did a great job here and we're from I spoke with uh, one of your colleagues um, Donovan Pepper in Chicago who I have a relationship with through uh, some conferences I've, I've seen he's a very good guy and, and a good colleague I, I think he he said he was going to put in a word for us and he mentioned that uh, he believes that this might be one of the first uh, of these concepts in the entire country. So we're happy to have it here in the city of Sterling Heights and, and wish you all a very good luck. So with that, um, council, I will uh, ask Ms. Riska if we could please have a roll call vote on the motion on the floor. Ms. Riska. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. And Mrs. Kasky? Yes. Okay, motion uh, passes 6 1. Uh, Mr. Canvasser, Mr. Frank, and uh, everyone else, uh, thank you for your participation and for answering our questions. We appreciate, uh, uh, we appreciate that. and. Um, Wish you nothing but good luck. So thank you very much. Okay, moving on, we'll go to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is an ordinance adoption. And this is to uh, consider adoption of a map amendment to zoning ordinance number 278 to conditionally rezone property situated on the east side of Dequinder Road, north of 14 Mile Road in section 31 from O2 planned office district to R60 one family residential district case number PZ 20 0001 Sikh Society of Michigan. Uh, council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt. Resolve to adopt the map amendment to zoning ordinance number 278 to conditionally rezone property situated on the east side of Dequinder. Road north of 14 Mile Road in section 31 from O2 Planned Office District to R60 One Family Residential District case PZ20 0001, subject to the terms and conditions of the conditional rezoning agreement that the mayor and the city clerk are hereby authorized to sign on behalf of the city. Is mayor there a Taylor. Second? Mayor Taylor. This is Zarko. Support been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Schmidt? Mayor Taylor, just briefly, um, this was 
discussed and explained to us at length in our last meeting. Um, essentially, uh, it's a residence for the head, head of the Sikh temple there. And so I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate to re do this rezoning and um, I'm in full support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Council, anyone else? Mrs. Zarko, anything? Nothing. Okay, council, any further discussion? With no further discussion, Ms. Riska, could we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. And Mr. Radke? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Motion carries 7-0. Next item on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda. Is there somebody who'd like to make a motion? Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Kosky? Move to approve the consent agenda. Mayor Taylor? Mrs. Zarko, do you support? I support. Been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor? Well, actually, we're going to go to a roll call vote. Ms. Riska, we please have a roll call vote. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. And Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Next item on our agenda is a consideration item, and this is to consider approval of the fiscal year 2020-2021 Community Development Block Grant One-Year Action Plan. We have a presentation from our city planner, Chris McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor and City Council again. Uh, let me pull up, I have a brief presentation for you tonight, um, as we do every year. Uh, so this year, the 2021 or 2020-2021 Community Development Block Grant, this is our 46th year of implementing uh, the Community Development Block Grant funds, uh, which provide so many services to our low to moderate income in those areas that uh, fall within that particular, those particular areas of the city. Um, so with that, I'd like to provide a brief synopsis of how those monies are proposed to be spent at this particular time. So our total allocation is what is projected at this point, and this is not a final number. Uh, they're, they're not final and for probably another couple months now, and that's always the case, is about $811,000. Um, and this is up slightly from uh, previous years. Uh, typically each year they do go up. Um, every year there is a bit of a scare, you know, typically when funding does come out of whether or not that money will remain true. But um, as in years past, this number has gone up slightly. So how do we utilize these funds? Um, you know, there's national directives that need to be met and there's local directives that need to be met as well. Um, some of those primary goals and some of those primary things that we're trying to accomplish is housing revitalization, uh, to revitalize our overall neighborhoods, improve community facilities, uh, for low and moderate income persons. And so again, that's what this money is directed towards. There's certain areas of the city uh, that qualify for these types of funds and this money is directed towards uh, those particular areas. There's also some general services that are provided to people who qualify. So even if you don't necessarily live within one of those qualifying areas, if you qualify in general and, re and are seeking out particular services and we'll go through those services in one moment, then in theory, uh, you have the ability to have uh, access to these particular funds. So with that being said, so funding considerations, how many, when we, when the CAC uh, Community Advisory Commission takes a look at this, um, how many, how many residents will benefit from the program? Has the requesting agency complied with CDBG requirements in the past? Uh, did the agency attend and present the request at a public hearing? That is a mandate. Uh, and what was the requesting agency able to answer questions about their particular program? So um, one of the main things, again, I wanna reiterate is that at this particular stage, when, when council reviews this, uh, the people who were at the public hearing and submitted their applications and their requests for funding uh, during the public hearing process, which was held at the, the CAC's meeting, um, those are the only agencies at this point that can receive funding. Um, 
So realistically, you know, in each one of those agencies that properly sought money uh, and got their applications and their requests in on time, uh, each one of those have received money has been the city's typical policy um, moving back a number of years uh, that basically we tried to present uh, money to each one of those entities um, closest to the amount that they're, that they're actually seeking. So these monies, uh, this total $811,000 is divvied up in a multitude of ways. Uh, a certain percentage of it is set aside for uh, administration of the program. Uh, we do have one full-time staff and one part-time staff basically dedicated to the implementation of CDBG. Um, the 15% shown on the screen here, and this is just a couple of the people that are, are receiving funding and have requested funding, but uh, is maxed out at 15%. And that is a mandate that we cannot change. Um, so every year, we, since this provides a, a substantial amount of benefit to those throughout the community um, that qualify uh, and meet the thresholds, uh, we try to max this number out every single year. And this year, that number right now is projected to be just about $122,000. Uh, which would again be provided for those services that are most needed uh, for those that fall you know, within this particular category. Then from there, 65% can then be allocated for actual capital projects. So basically 20% for administration, 15% for services, and then the remainder can be used for capital projects. This year, uh, there's a couple big hitters. The Sanford Drive concrete replacements is one. Minor home repair uh, is one that we typically find. Obviously, that's uh, low income grants uh, for people doing small minor repairs to their house. And then Shaner Tower generator replacement is, is a significant portion of this overall allocation uh, where the, the generator that would run the entire building uh, should power outage occur or some other you know, catastrophic event which would cut power to the building uh, would, would provide for that. The current generator is outdated and doesn't necessarily run the building as it needs to um, should a total failure occur. So um, we, the CDBG funds would help take care of that particular problem. So with that, I'll, I'll leave that as, as questions that, that council may have. Again, the, the funding that has been provided for services has been maintained. There's really no significant changes in that. Um, again, then the capital improvements each year, we try to pick some, some local road improvements. Those road improvements need to be within the qualifying areas. And we typically have uh, some improvements to either the senior center uh, previous, in previous years, this year it was at Shaner Towers uh, that we provide for those capital improvements. So, but with that, I'll be more than glad to try to answer any questions uh, that you may have at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. McLeod. Council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Uh, yes, was that Mrs. Sorowski? Yes, it is. Go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, result to approve the fiscal year 2020-2021 Community Development Block Grant one-year action plan as recommended by the Citizens Advisory Committee and the City Administration based on an entitlement of $811,624 and authorize the City Administration to complete the federal application and secure the funds. Thank you, Council. Mrs. Zarco. Support. 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 It's been moved. Thank you, Mrs. Zarco. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Sorowski? Um, just very briefly, I wanted to uh, thank Mr. McLeod for an excellent presentation on where these funds go. Obviously, these are used for very worthy and worthwhile causes. This money is not for the city. It is not to put in anything more than improve the city and improve the people's lives that uh, live in it. So I am very much in favor of it. And uh, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Uh, Mrs. Zarko, anything? Um, not really anything but a comment. And I'm, I'm glad that Mr. McLeod explained to the residents exactly how um, the money is divided and the fact that um, they, anybody that applied for the money did receive something. So there's always somebody that said, why didn't so-and-so get this? Or, and how come we didn't give you know, to another organization? But I think in explaining that these were the only people that actually asked for help this year and they all received something um, is, is great. So nothing further. All right, thank you, Mrs. Zarco. Council, any further discussion? If not, I just would like to uh, commend the work of the Citizens Advisory Committee for uh, what they do every year to uh, 
allocate this money, thank them for their service to the city. And um, with that, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Uh, next item on our agenda tonight is communications from citizens. As noted, we are receiving communications from citizens via teleconference tonight. All members of the public will continue to be muted until called upon. Uh, those remaining on the phone that wish to participate in communications from citizens will be recognized in turn and asked whether that person has comment at that time. If you wish to participate, in this portion of the meeting, please press star nine. You can do it now uh, and, uh, and I will see that your hand has been raised. It'll notify me that you wanna speak. So again, if you're on the line and you wanna speak, uh, you can press star nine. When prompted, state your name. I'll allow you to address the city council. Please be advised that there could be delays. Um, I'm gonna check the number of calls that we have on, which is a minimal number of calls. Uh, but if you do wanna participate, um, do press star nine and we'll get to you based on the number of calls. We're going to have uh, four minutes of participation, which is our normal uh, amount of time. There's no reason to limit the amount of uh, speaker participation. And just uh, again, this is participation on any item on tonight's agenda or any item not on tonight's agenda, except for the public hearing. So if you have any comment on any city business, now is the time to do it. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, the uh, resident who was speaking earlier. I'm going to unmute you, sir, and you have the floor. Uh, please state your name again. It was David Habib, was it? Yes, yes, Mayor, Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Yeah, You're just, welcome. Just you had a, floor. Just had a couple of questions. Thank you uh, for you and the, the city council. Uh, going back to the part about reopening, the comments from Mr. Vanderpool about certain policies, 25% uh, capacity was one thing. Uh, the masks, mandatory masks was one I heard. Are those things that the city here is being directed to mandate or is that something that uh, this body has, has decided to do? So, sir, what we do under communications from citizens is this is your four minutes to, to address us. We don't engage in back and forth or question and answer, but we'll take down your questions. And then after everybody's had an opportunity to speak, we will um, either the council or city manager will address your questions. OK. 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 Yeah, that was just one question, but I, I guess I'm sorry. This is my first time uh, even participating in a city council meeting, so forgive me. But um, but like I said before, guys, I, I've um, been really pleased as a resident of this city growing up here, um, raising my family here. And uh, I think we're all <laughs> we're all concerned with uh, everything that's happening around us. And uh, so just just had some basic questions along those lines and uh, maybe just uh, a comment uh, as well. Um, I, I heard that we were gonna, you know, be looking at the end of May, you know, and that that could move or we're not sure. And, uh, you know, this is a result of um, um, our executive orders and, and so on. Um, will the city consider sticking to that date regardless? Like I said, sir, we'll, we'll get your questions answered, but we're we're not going to do it right at this portion. We're going to take all the communications from citizens. And then we, when we move on, we'll get those questions answered, okay? Okay. Okay, very good. All right, anything else tonight, sir? No, not, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, having you on for your first council meeting. I'm gonna move on to the next caller that uh, has their hand raised. 
This is the phone number ending in 9930. I am going to unmute you now. Please announce your name and you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor City Council members. This is Jasmine Early from Sterling Heights. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and um, I'm happy to hear everybody is doing well. Um, my comment is regarding uh, the city manager mentioned the um, plans for the city to talk about amending the city charter to change the required signatures for petitioning. Um, I had mentioned it in Facebook. I, I, be, I believe we should move the way um, a lot of offices where people are running for office, they only ask for 100 or 200 signatures or a $50 fee or $100 fee. I think that we, that could be something that you may consider um, to make it another option. Um, also, it was mentioned about the terms for city council members and the mayor. Um, will that be leaning to the term limits too, which was not discussed, but we know um, Sometimes city council members stay many years and there is no opportunity for a new phase. Um, so I, it's something that you may think about it, how long, um, now that you are talking about how many years and when the elections should be done, even or add numbers, also how many years that person will be in office. Um, there is one comment, the uh, comment no, there is a concern and please, I called the city before, uh, the DPW department, but the, it was closed. There is an issue being uh, going on on Somerset Street, which is, which is behind Myers. Um, there is a grease and soapy discharge into the storm drain. I checked, I took pictures, but we couldn't report it. I called the P call for the Eagle Department, Department of Environmental, and they sent me to the city, but the city was not responding. So if you could please check, it is on Somerset Street, which is um, north of um, 15 Mile, behind Meyer. Uh, it's something that they may need to check. I will appreciate somebody is sent there to be checked out. And last but not the least, um, I would like to wish everybody a happy Memorial Day. I know this year it's gonna be different, but I hope everybody is doing fine and is safe and remember um, those who gave the last sacrifice for our country and stay safe. Look forward to our city to be open safely and everybody going back to work. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Early. Appreciate your participation tonight. It does not appear that there's anyone else on the call uh, for uh, participation. So I will close this portion of the meeting and we will move on to reports from city administration. Uh, Mr. Vanderpool, any response uh, to any of the comments or any, any reports tonight? You're on mute, uh, Mr. Vanderpool. Okay, Mayor, I'd be happy to follow up, starting with Mr. Habib. Uh, first, there were some questions about, are we mandated to enact these plans? And the short answer is uh, yes, the, the governor's executive orders do require that uh, businesses as they reopen, uh, develop uh, reopening plans um, that can be more restrictive than uh, some of her, uh, some of the guidelines that are outlined in her executive orders. So uh, we have proceeded uh, with our reopening plans under the premise of the guidelines provided by the CDC and also the governor's six, plan, six phase reopening plan, uh, common social distancing practices and so on. So, um, you know, there's not a hard and fast strict mandate that if you don't follow it, you're going to be 
uh, penalized, so to speak. Uh, but our plan was developed under what we uh, consider, as I've mentioned a few times this evening, best practices and centered on making sure that our employees are safe and equally important uh, visitors to our city facilities are safe. And we think, uh, we, we firmly believe we've achieved that objective. Uh, Mr. Habib also asked, will we be sticking with the May uh, 29th, well, actually the June 2nd official opening date, uh, if the governor extends the stay-at-home order or prohibits us from doing so under the office category, which there is a chance of that. I think it's a small chance, but a chance nonetheless. And the short answer is we have to comply with the governor's executive orders. Uh, there's not an opportunity to violate them. So we would be in full compliance uh, with the governor's executive order. Um, I think that was it from um, Mr. Habib, but I will also uh, comment on uh, Ms. Early's uh, um, concern about Somerset Street. <clears throat> we'll take a look at that tomorrow. So I've heard of it. Our DPW department may already be aware of it. Uh, just for uh, the community's uh, sake, uh, if you go to our website page and click on the main COVID menu at the top, you really can't miss it. Uh, there's numerous ways that residents can contact the city directly. <clears throat> there's a general assistance direct phone line that's uh, uh, staffed every day. Uh, we get regular use of that. That's also the senior assistance line. Uh, seniors call on that regularly. And then we uh, list a num number of other important numbers. And we also highlight that you can email us at City Hall at sterling-heights.net. So there shouldn't be any, any, any reason whatsoever residents can't get in contact with staff right now. We're conducting regular business every day uh, and have been doing so with hundreds of uh, businesses and inquiries over this period of time. Uh, that concludes my comments, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Um, Mr. Kashubsky, any uh, items tonight? Uh, yes, Mayor, we do have one matter for closed session tonight. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kashubsky. Council, I'll open it up to uh, any uh, reports or new business or unfinished business. In fact, I, you know, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to go first, uh, which is not something I normally do, um, but I'm going to take that uh, take that opportunity tonight. Uh, one thing briefly, um, I do want to add to what Mr. Vanderpool said about uh, about the governor's executive order. That yeah, we were, we are going to continue to follow the governor's executive order. Uh, I'm on a list serve of um, mayors from around the state of Michigan and. Somebody sent out an email today or yesterday asking uh, whether their their city is going to uh, is going to issue any guidelines um, contra to what the governor has said uh, in terms of opening things back up or uh, even just in city hall and and at every city and there was dozens uh, probably fifty to hundred cities and mayors responded saying no we are not going to and we are going to continue following the governor's order. And, and really, almost every, I, I'm, I think every municipality has, I don't know of any municipality in the state of Michigan that simply said, we are going to violate the governor's orders. Now, sometimes you hear a sheriff up in Northern Michigan that has said, we're not going to enforce it. Um, but uh, with what the governor has done recently to reopen uh, those Northern Michigan areas, I don't know that that's going to be an issue anymore. But for us, we're going to continue to follow uh, the governor's lead on this, and, and hopefully we can get back to work soon, but uh, we are going to monitor that. So I do want to just say, um, based on the presentations that uh, we had from Mr. Vanderpool earlier today, um, it would be my preference to have uh, for the next city council meeting, the June 2nd uh, city council meeting, which if all things go according to plan and the governor's stay-at-home order is lifted, or at least modified in a way that you, we can resume office work. Uh, the plan is for the city council to convene uh, in person for the next meeting at the community center. It, it will be modified and uh, there will be guidelines in place for social distancing, but it will also be open to the public. 
and um, there it will be set up in a way to maintain the public safety. At that meeting, I would like the city administration to bring forward two proposals that can be uh, voted on by the residents. Well, first, they would have to be voted on by a five-sevenths majority of the city council to be placed at the November general election. Um, one proposal being to reduce the signature requirement to qualify uh, to be on the ballot to run for mayor or city council, and the other to uh, ask for a charter amendment for four-year terms. Um, my preference would be that the signature requirement be reduced to 400, uh, but uh, I don't know that tonight is the appropriate time to debate the number. Uh, from where I sit, I believe that we have essentially three options. We can either have it a fixed number, 400, 500, 600, um, or on any fixed number. We can have a percentage, right now it's 1% of the registered voters, or we can have a fee. I would not be in favor of a fee, either a nominal fee, or like $100, or a, a high fee, like $500 to $1,000. I would like to see a fixed number, uh, but I would be um, interested if the council is, uh, if, it, if it's the pleasure of the council to have a percentage, uh, that, that could uh, work as well. But I'd like the administration to bring back a proposal that can be placed on the November ballot for a change in the signature requirement. And additionally, I'd like for the administration to bring a proposal to increase the term length for the mayor and the city council from two years to four years, uh, with those elections being uh, consecutive uh, for all of the council members at the same time. So non-staggered uh, with uh, that change starting in 2021. Um, so, I will allow uh, the council, if there's any objection or if there's any discussion on this, uh, to um, take this opportunity to uh, to voice that objection or to uh, have that discussion. Is there anyone that would like the floor? Mayor Taylor. Uh, Ms. Sarowski. Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I'll jump right in. So I do have some thoughts on this and I am going to just voice my thoughts. So yes, I am definitely in favor of reducing the signature requirement. I'm not, um, it is very, even for elected officials who have a lot of people helping them, it's very hard to get a thousand signatures or 862 and then we would have to bump up to make sure we were covering every instance. So approximately a thousand, it was, it's a difficult thing to obtain. All those signatures were very limited in the location. So I have absolutely no problem with reducing it. It opens up opportunity for other residents. It is very, it is such a burden. It is, uh, I, I believe it's quite unfair the way it is now. So happy to have that go down. 400, if we want to reduce it by half, I would think I would rather do a certain percentage because we already have it listed as a 1%. Let's make it a 0.5% so that it's at least the language is consistent would be my feeling on that. And then the second um, amendment that we're looking at, the four-year term um, amendment, I am in favor of it with some conditions. I do really believe that we should never, if, if it's going to be cost savings, obviously staggered terms really negates that. So I would not even be interested in a, in a staggered uh, four-year term op option. But I do want to make sure that we do have the a change in the appointment process for those for that off for those seats. If someone um, needs to vacate that seat, an elected official needs to vacate a seat that's a four-year seat, then we have and we as council or the council would appoint a person. That person may take sit on council until the next election cycle of any election or whatever election we choose and but the very next election cycle and they must run for that seat again. That otherwise we're appointing someone for potentially three and a half to four years of, of, of just an appointment, that would not be fair. So that would be, those are my conditions that I'm looking at. I know that we do, there is precedent set for that in the judicial side where if a, a person is appointed to a judicial seat that's vacated, they may serve out the, um, that term until the, ne the next election cycle as well. So that's very easy. Um, to see that it works well. And so those would be the things I would be 
looking forward to if, if we could go to it. I don't want to though give, I wanna make sure that the residents understand we are not trying to pile on um, things that help us in, in light of the COVID scare this current pandemic, if it goes further, if there's other pandemics, which obviously we um, were lucky not to have in our the last 80 years of our life or 100 years of our lifetime, but here we are. And so this is certainly something that's not going to go away. But I do think that this is a time to address these two because of the fact that we cannot socially gather or be close to each other as easily as we have in the past. So that's my thoughts on that. And I thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Sarowski. Council, anyone else, any discussion on this, these two proposals, any objection? Mrs. Kosky? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've always said that we need to go back to four-year terms. I do not like a uh, staggered term because especially if the mayor has a two-year term, that would allow three council members to run against the mayor. And if they lose, of course, they keep their seat. So I am a very strong proponent of everyone running at once. And that's not just to save you, it's the idea, it's not fair. So yes, I'm in favor of the four years. I would like to see a fixed number rather than a percentage because our, our population is going to increase and decrease over the years. And you're going to have new voters and you're going to have some voters that are no longer there. So I would rather have a certain number so that you know what you have to get. You don't have to guess, well, how many registered voters do we have this year? So I'm in favor of the number you suggested, 400. But I would also like to have the option to either get the 400 signatures or pay $400. I like that option simply because we never know when we're going to run into something uh, that we have no control over, where Mother Nature takes over and we don't have a good opportunity to get out there and get those signatures. The other idea is where we can collect signatures has been reduced to the point where it's very difficult. It seems like we go to the library all the time. You walk the streets. People today, it seems like they don't want to open the door anymore. We used to be able to go to the grocery stores. You no longer can do that. <laughs> they see you standing out there with your clipboard and it's, uh, excuse me, but uh, you can't do that. I like the idea of, if someone uh, gives up their seat and someone is appointed, that that person that is appointed has to then run for the unexpired term at the next election. I think that's a great thing to add in there. So I'm all in favor of that. Term limits, I think the residents determine term limits quite well. So that's my thoughts. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Kosky. Council, uh, Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, first of all, a question to you is, um, I'm not sure your direction to, to the city manager, city administration, is to come back with this on the next meeting, but without direction of a number or a percentage. So do you want them yeah. to come up with that number or percentage? Um, no, not necessarily. So I think it's going to depend a little bit on, on how the discussion goes tonight. But I think what we could do, what I'm trying to accomplish tonight is to just set the table for at the next meeting, having the debate. So I don't intend on, you know, kind of saying, saying why I think one way or the other, or, or trying to, to find a happy medium here. Um, I think that from the city administration standpoint, talking with them, they need some direction. If this is, if they have the direction to proceed to prepare these agenda items for the next meeting, um, they're going to want to have some sense of where the council is. So either it's going to be a percent or a number is what I'm thinking. Um, if there's going to be a change, it's, so they could they could probably pretty easily prepare 
two agenda items for the signatures, one with a percent, one with a number, possibly okay. one with a fee, but I don't know if that's going to pan out. Uh, and the other being the four year terms. Um, you know, if, if the council's all over the board, I want staggered, I want unstaggered, I want this or that. But it, if, if the council kind of all says, you know, four year terms, non staggered, um, no term limits, things like that, then they should be able to pretty easily put together an agenda item and then we could just debate the very specifics. I think from what I'm hearing, we got to get some clarification as to what the charter says about the appointment process and how that would be applied if we go to four year terms, because that might need to be something that's changed too. But other than that, I'm just looking to, to have that debate next week. Okay, I, I was really referring to the number of signatures in, and not the terms, but um, I guess, you know, if we're gonna change it, um, I would, and it helps everyone. It helps those incumbents, it helps people that, that aren't in office right now to reduce the number. Um, I think I would be more comfortable with what the state threshold is at 600 or 75% um, or, or 0.75%. Um, I would never be in favor of paying a fee. I think when you run for this office, um, you have to put some sweat equity. You have to show that you are willing to do the work to get the position because um, it's a lot of work once you get here. So uh, I would, um, I think that eliminates people that are not really serious about the position, that just want to break up votes. Um, so I, I like the state threshold of 600, if, if we're gonna do any change at all. So, and as far as the four-year terms, um, I would be in favor of the four-year, not staggered terms. Term limits, I think we're term limited to every election. I think what happens, and it's been proven at the state level, when there's a term, term limit, um, you lose some really good people to term limits. And um, we are before our voters every two years right now, and uh, they can change us if they aren't happy with us. And if they are satisfied with us, then they vote us back in. So I think that that is our term limit. So that's all I have to say on both matters. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Schmidt. Uh, anyone else, uh, council? Mayor Mrs. Taylor. Mrs. Arco. Okay, um, you know, I've given this a lot of thought because this isn't the first time that we've thought about it. But I wanna know that I want, first of all, I want the residents to know that the reason why uh, we're not changing this because of COVID-19. This has come up for, I bet, the last 15 years that I've been on council that we've talked about reducing the number of signatures um, because it is difficult. It really is. And anybody that's done this knows that you carry a petition, whether it be in your purse or your pocket, for sometimes 15 months in order to get the signatures that you need. So. Um, I am in favor of changing the number. I would prefer, I, in fact, I know I want a percentage. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is um, because the city we hope is going to continue to grow. But however, if we have a reduced number of registered voters, then the number would also come down. So um, to say that, you know, early, if you set it at a certain number, and you find out that um, you know 10 years down the road or 15 years down the road, there's a decrease, then it still puts the same burden on people that we're talking about now that you're not gonna have as many registered voters, but you still need the signatures. So, I mean, that's why I think a percentage is probably a fair way to, to go about this. Um, you know, it's whatever we do, and however we decide to do this, I think it would be a good idea if we're all on the same page, because if it's going to happen, I want this to pass. I don't, because we've had four year terms on the ballots twice before and they failed. So if we're going to do this, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page, all for the same reason, so that um, we can get the community behind this so that it is a success. So that's really what I've been, you know, I've been thinking about through through all of this. I certainly am in favor of a four-year term. 
um, I, and bringing up the fact of a, an appointment, um, I'm not positive, but I think there is something in the charter already that says if it's so many months before an election, it has to go to a special election in order to fill that seat. And that certainly would be more common now with a, if it happened to be a four-year term than a two-year term. So um, because I think that's what happens. Um, and I think that's why we appoint within a certain number of days as well. So we don't have to have those special elections. Uh, but that might be something that has to be adjusted as far uh, if we make the change. And and that the other thought is, does that go on the ballot at this? I would think it would go on the ballot at the same time that you were changing um, the term limits rather than later on have, you know, have to vote on something a second time. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, and once again, as I've talked to, I've talked to the mayor about this and a lot of times we um, think, you know, what's in my best interest? Well, you know what, everybody will benefit from this, that there's no way that we're not gonna all benefit from this as far as anybody that wants to run for office. But is this, what is in the best interest of the city? That, that's my other question that I've asked myself. And um, certainly I think um, reducing the number of signatures is not going to hurt the city. I just think that, like I said, I certainly am in favor of a percentage base because I still think that protects the city uh, moving forward as far as um, the cost of a primary election. Um, the next thing would be, um, we talk about term limits. Um, leadership is not a term limit. Leadership is something that you do because one, you're good at it, or two, it's something that you know that people listen to you. That's leadership uh, and they trust you. So, I mean, that's something that you think about. Um, and we know that what a deb debacle that is with um, term limits on the state level where um, you have people coming in that have no experience and the representatives, you know, as a representative and already knowing that maybe a Senate seat's going to open up, a state Senate seat's going to open up. So they're worried about that seat rather than doing the job that they have where they're at. Um, so I would never be in favor of a term limit. I feel that term limits are at the ballot box. And um, if people want me to serve and want me to lead, uh, lead and they trust me to do it, then thank you very much. But um, certainly um, if they, I don't think anybody should be put out of office if they're doing a good job. So um, I think that's all I have to say on that issue. Now, Mayor Taylor, are you gonna give us a chance to speak on something else or are we just talking about term limits and signatures right now? It entirely depends on whether you object to my proposals that I presented tonight. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll all get a chance to go around and you can, yeah, around you can again. go. Thank you. Once, uh, once we nothing... finish this, everybody will get a chance to, to Okay. Bring a report well, or whatever they have. Okay, nothing further on this topic. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilman Yanez or Radke, any, any discussion or comment, objection? Mr. Mr. Rad. Thank you. Um, to your proposal, uh, I am in favor of both things. I think that we should go down to a fixed number of signatures at 400. I think that's the most appropriate method. Uh, it would still be one of the highest thresholds in the state. While I think it also would create opportunity for other people who might want to run for office to have an easier time. Us too. It, it's kind of insane that we are forced to stand outside in the sun to run for office here in Sterling Heights. At a certain point, it just becomes gratuitous the number of signatures we have to gather. So I'm in favor of that. I'm also in favor of four-year terms. I like staggered terms, but the council doesn't. So I'm in favor of just regular uh, four-year terms. I do believe, however, I agree with uh, the mayor pro tem, Mrs. Sorowski, that uh, a special election should be called if we appoint someone with more than, say, two years left on their term. Because, for example, when Nate Shannon left, uh, he left almost the beginning of a new term. And that's fine when you have a two-year election because the next election's already coming. But if it was a, if it was a four-year term, there'd be three years left on his term. And I think that that's unfair to the voters for us to leave and appoint someone without them having a say. So I think the next uh, intervening, intervening election should be a special election that allows the voters to have their say on a 
new council person. Uh, I'm against term limits completely. I think that the voters are term limits. Uh, they decide who they want to be in office, who they don't want. I think all term limits do is um, take people who are well-skilled and put them out of a job, which makes no sense to me at all. Uh, if the voters think I'm doing a bad job, they should vote me out. And that's how I see it. That's all I have on this topic, but I'd like to speak again like Mrs. Zarko. Okay, thank you, Mr. Radke. Um, Mr. Yanez? Yeah, so um, I'm in agreement of a static number. Uh, I kicked this around a lot today, looking at percentages. Um, I do agree with Mrs. Yarko, though, that I don't anticipate City of Sterling Heights losing 30,000 residents anytime soon. But we, as a, a council and as city leaders, we should be forward looking. So maybe having something like a 1% not to exceed 400 or 500, um, I, I think might be an option. But simply having a, a static number um, that uh, maintains from election to election, I think is, is beneficial. You know, it's not, you know, 843 one year and 851 then you know the next election um certainly four-year terms um you know we also have to keep in mind that we have a city manager form of government so um you know our manager does most of the heavy lifting that's not to say city council doesn't work but the fact of the matter is we do have a city manager form of government and i think four-year terms for uh, our situation um uh, fits very well um, and I do appreciate the uh, concern that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sarosky brought up, and uh, I'd like to hear more about that as well, if we do already have something in the city charter that addresses that. So um, I support a fixed number, whether it's 400 or 600. I do support four-year non-staggered terms. And uh, as far as term limit goes, I, I, I can tell you firsthand from experience, uh, term limits is, uh, unless you're gonna have 20-year term limits, uh, is a very difficult thing to help uh, uh, move a city forward. So um, I would be against uh, any short-term term limits. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yana. So uh, Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kashubsky, I'm sure you've been keeping notes. Um, so it looks like on the four-year term, we have pretty broad consensus here that we'd like to have a proposal brought forward at the next city council meeting for the November uh, general election for four year non-staggered terms. My, my request is that you give us some sort of background on what would happen if that were to pass based on the way the charter's are written right now for an appointment. What I think, I'm not sure um, if I was understanding Mrs. Zarco correctly, but what I understand is that right now, if there's a vacancy, we've got, a set period of days, like 90 days or something to make an appointment. If we don't make an appointment, then there has to be a special election. However, if there's more, if there's less than like a certain period of time, if there's less than a few months until the next election, then you don't have the special election, you just have the general election. So we're just gonna need clarification on how, how all that works. And, and that would be appropriate to, to provide um, as part of it. And I think I can also speak for the council when I say, Many of the members on this council are going to vote for four-year terms only if there is a provision where um, appointments have to go to a special election if there's more than say two years. So, so I, I think we're all on the same page there. A little bit more complicated is the signature requirement, but I'm counting five council members who said that they would be comfortable with a fixed number, whether it be 400 or 600, uh, four council members who used the number 400, one council member that used the word, used the, the figure 600, one council member who said 400 or 600. So we've got five council members that would be comfortable with a fixed term. We have uh, one, two, three council members who would be comfortable with a percentage and two of them, um, I'm sorry, one of them would also be comfortable with a fixed term. So, so I, I think you ought to bring it back with both of the options, a fixed number and a percentage, because it's not, I wouldn't, we don't have five council members who are all in agreement, fixed number 400 or fixed number 600. Um, so I, I think there, there might be a way to compromise somewhere in there, um, but uh, 
Let me know if you need more clarification right now. Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kaszubski, do you have clear direction for the next council meeting? Mayor, on the topic um, of um, signatures, I think it's probably about as clear as it can get tonight. Uh, thankfully, we're able to watch this section of the meeting over a few times before the next meeting. So I think we'll be able to summarize uh, uh, kind of which, where, where, where the council's headed with this and give you some good options. Uh, and I agree on the, on the four-year terms. It seems like that's much clearer, but we'll get there. Keep in mind, we have... Uh, we have June 2nd to, as you said, uh, debate the agenda item and, and some of the options. And then certainly June 16th, then it'll become crystal clear. Okay, uh, Mr. Kaszubski, any uh, clarification or questions needed tonight? You're on mute if you're talking. Did he, we might've lost, did we lose Mr. Kaszubski? We might've. Okay, well, we're just going to have to, if you, you know, if you guys, if you need me, I'll, I'll uh, answer any legal questions that you have tonight. Um, this is actually really bad timing for Mark to drop off the call because we kind of were relying on him to help us get into the next portion of the agenda. So hopefully he comes back on, but what we'll do now is uh, I'll open it up to the council for any uh, any reports or any uh, unfinished business. Anyone who'd like uh, the floor, please unmute yourself and ask for it now. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yanez. Yeah, one, one more thought on the, um, I have something else here, but one more thought on the uh, signatures. Um, while I don't anticipate uh, COVID-19 uh, coming back, some people say it might, it might come back in an even worse way. Um, I feel that we should also just, in the back of our minds as we're doing this, think about what happens if we can't get seven people to get enough petition signatures because people don't want to sign petitions. It's still a physical event where someone has to take an ink pen in their hand and put their name on a piece of paper and someone has to hand that to them and take it away from them or leave it on a table but they're still physically coming in close contact with things that people touch. And if for some reason this pandemic comes back or another pandemic comes along and becomes more difficult for to get people to actually physically sign a petition under the system that we have now because we do not have electronic signatures yet, um, we should take that into uh, consideration as we move forward with this particular discussion. What happens if we don't have seven people get enough signatures? So um, having said that, um, I do want to point out that uh, the Sterling Heights VFW uh, does a great job on behalf of veterans. Um, and the Sterling Heights VFW, like everybody else, has bills to pay. And unfortunately, the, uh, the functions that they have to help raise money to pay for rent, and some of the things they do to help uh, veterans, uh, they haven't been able to do them because of the Stay Home, uh, Stay Safe uh, program. So one of the things that uh, the Sterling Heights VFW is doing is they're taking all those uh, 10 cent return bottles and cans that we can't take back to the stores yet because the stores aren't taking them. Um, so they are doing a can and bottle drive at their facility. Uh, their facility is located at uh, 44400 Van Dyke. That's on uh, Van Dyke across from the uh, park in Utica, just south of uh, Clinton River Road. Uh, they're taking those cans and bottles uh, Monday through Friday from one to five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and so if you have bottles and cans stacking up in your garage or your basement, you want to get rid of them, uh, a donation to uh, the Sterling Heights uh, BFW American Legion would be uh, greatly appreciated. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yanez. Council, anyone else tonight? Very briefly, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sorowski. Yep, so I am, I thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, just, I wanted to say very quickly that yes, I'm very much looking forward to having a true meeting at the uh, community center. We will be, just so the residents know, we will be wearing masks. We will, we can take them off while talking, but because it is important for you, the residents to be able to see our mouths, but we do need to remember we, will, we have to be masked when we're uh, just sitting there. But, um, so that will be exactly 
two weeks from three weeks from today. And I'm looking so much forward to that, to starting to get back to a little bit more normalcy. Um, and I do want to say one real brief thing since we, I did want to touch very briefly since um, Mr. Yenes did set this up so that we could do a couple little, I want to talk just about the, the number of the votes just one more time. I'm not married to a percentage, not married to a fixed number option. Sweat equity is extremely important in this and I believe in working very hard to obtain votes and, and, and convince voters that we are good candidates. But if we do hit, like Mr. Yanis said, another situation or continuing situation where we can't touch pen to paper or even you know somebody could cough on our paper, then what? So we have a lot of opportunity in this to, to, to try to get it right. I do think that the dollar amount per vote or per signature might be a good option. That if we cannot get those signatures of whatever percentage we say, it would be the dollar amount equal to the, the number of signatures. That I think might be a really good option. If we can't get person to person, we still need to move our government forward. The old fashioned way, the traditional way of getting hand to paper signatures is not, probably not gonna be viable forever. And that's what I think. So, all right, thank you, that's it. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Mrs. Zarko. Hi, um, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, just to um, say a few things. First of all, um, I wanna congratulate all the Community Foundation scholarship recipients because usually we have them at a special meeting and we're able to congratulate them, but um, with everything going on this year, we weren't able to, so congratulations to all the recipients. Um, the, also, uh, Mayor Taylor, I appreciate your update as far as the conversations that you've been having with other mayors throughout the country. And certainly, um, you know, it seems like everybody is on board um, and not, you know, with at least running their cities, because right now I really believe that local municipalities are really running everything. I, I truly believe that. Um, and thankfully, we have Mr. Vanderpool to help us out there because he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting and we all look good, but we still all get together to make sure that um, we're all on, you know, doing uh, what we need to do. Uh, you know what, um, I think uh, Mr. Yan has brought up a, a really good point. Um, I'd like to do some research on electronic signatures because um, although we can say, you know, we can put all these provisions in, um, the, this is a very unusual circumstance and hopefully we're not going to have to do this for another hundred years and I won't be around so somebody else can take care of it. But um, I, I think there's got to be some provisions um, and I don't think it's necessarily monetary and signature combinations, but I certainly would be in favor of researching electronic signatures and find out how it works. Um, what other uh, community states who, you know, where else this is done and is um, how it's controlled so that it's legal. And um, I'd be interested in us researching that as another option, maybe down the road um, for another time like this. But I, I really think that right now is, um, it's very unusual and ex extraordinary circumstance. I would be the first one to say that it would be great if we didn't have an election next year and that, and uh, you know, we could just continue with or you know, the, the residents would give us another two years now so that we could work through this crisis, but that's not what we can do. So we, so what is going to be um, the best uh, practice to move the city forward? But I, I certainly would be interested in finding out more research on electronic signatures and how we could use that in the future. Um, and I think, um, I think that's it and happy Memorial Day to everybody. And remember that um, we have to think about those families that you know didn't, that um, had that missing plate at the table, not just on Memorial Day, but uh, every day. So um, I shouldn't say missing, the person, the, the plate's there, but the person's not. So um, uh, nothing further. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sarko. Uh, anyone else, Council, Mrs. Schmidt? Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I too would like to just acknowledge uh, the upcoming Memorial Day. I know we're all used to being at a big parade, big festive day, um, honoring those that gave the ultimate sacrifice and also honoring those families who, whose um, 
family members gave the ultimate sacrifice. You know, we we tend to put ourselves in a in a bubble in a bubble, and uh, it's very apparent the last two months we've all been in our own bubble. But there are a lot of families out there that deal with a lot of issues, and um, those soldiers that that gave the ultimate price um, really gave us the opportunity for everything we do every day in our freedoms. And um, I let's not forget. Let's not forget. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I concur with my colleagues. Happy Memorial Day. This year is going to be unlike uh, most years where we get together and have a parade and honor those that have served our country and given up their lives. Um, it's just kind of a crazy time, but it makes you kind of remember and anchor you. I was looking at my phone the other day. It's been 67 days since I got sick and had to come inside. So it seems like it's been two years. It's been 67 days. You think about how much you go outside, how much you interact with other people, but six, seven days at home is like a lifetime. So it's just, I'm so sad that we, we're missing it this year. And all my colleagues are too, because we really enjoy interacting with the public and just being able to honor the people who have served our community, both overseas and at home. It's just so amazing. Um, secondly, uh, uh, to Mr. Yanez's comment, uh, one of the problems with the the election this year and why the state, well, why a judge administratively reduced uh, the ballot uh, signature requirements in half, where there were some townships and cities that have requirements that no one was able to make the ballot. So they had a whole council essentially running as writing candidates because they were unable to make the ballot because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was part of the filings in that case. And to go further than that, um, I wanted to briefly through the chair to Mrs. Riska. I read in both the paper today and your memo from last week, uh, the state election board has issued new guidance on absentee ballot mailings. Could you tell us about that, Mrs. Riska? Ms. Riska. Yeah, so last week, um, the Bureau of Elections issued a statement changing their opinion on um, whether or not communities could mail out absentee applications to all registered voters. Previously, they've been of the opinion that we cannot, so they have since changed that opinion. Um, there has been a new development um, that you probably have read in the Detroit News today, um, and clerks across the state just found out about it um, this morning um, that the sec that Secretary Benson. Um, set, actually did send out AV applications to all registered voters that are not on a permanent um, absentee ballot application list. So in our community, currently we have um, 80, something like 89,881 registered voters. We have um, almost 15,000 people on our permanent absentee list. I did confirm with the Bureau of Elections that our absentee applications for all of those individuals not on the permanent absent voter list um, did go out in the mail yesterday and today for our community um, so that the Secretary of State did do that. Could you tell us what the cost savings would be on that? I'm just curious. It's 86,000 she mailed or 86,000 minus 15,000? Yeah, so it's 89,000, or I'm sorry, about 90,000, so 89,800, so 90,000, so she mailed out about 75,000. I would say that the cost savings for us, um, you know, I, I don't know, off the top of my head, so please don't quote me it's here. It's a rough I, estimate, I know. You know. I would probably say it's about oh, maybe $18,000. It's wonderful. I, I'm so pleased that uh, Secretary of State Benson did this. She had mentioned to me that she was thinking about doing it. So I'm so enthused that she did do it. I think it's going to be great for the community. Um, everyone's going to be able to vote uh, from home safely if they want to. And if they don't, we're still going to have precincts open election day to come in and vote. But I hope that everyone that can does avail of themselves of this option. It'll protect yourself from uh, COVID-19. It'll protect our volunteers that have to staff our precincts. And I think it's an overwhelming, a great option. I'm also in favor of a proposal that we've talked about here and I hope is coming back up 
uh, drop boxes at the four fire stations, hopefully, in City Hall. And I hope my colleagues will concur with that. Now that we have all these applications going out, I'd like people to have a safe option to return their ballot, especially because I do hear some talk about the Postal Service being especially slow during this time. So I'm strongly in favor of that. And with that, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke, Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mayor. The reason that I brought up the dollar amount with a uh, fixed number of signatures as a choice was because I feel the same as Councilman Mianis, that what if there is some conditions that are out of our control and that prevents us from getting signatures, even electronic signatures. There's a lot of people, especially your seniors, that love to um, sign petitions, but don't know how to do it electronically. So I would like to pursue that part of it, have a dollar amount available in the event that Mother Nature says, no, you're not gonna get signatures this time around. So that was my thought there. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Koski. And I wanna thank the uh, council for indulging and having that discussion about those two proposals. I think it's, um, it was a productive discussion and I'm uh, looking forward to the next council meeting where we can get this on the ballot. And I, I think it, it, what it boils down to is uh, good government, efficient government for continuity of services and for um, you know, making sure that we're, we're following the best practices in the county, state and the country um, I think it's important to, um, to to look at that and update it. And uh, certainly the residents will have the final uh, decision to make there, but uh, I think that the timing is right to certainly uh, save some money. We have uh, you know uncertain budget coming up and a lot of um, a lot of projections of lost revenue. Um, I, I was on a call today with um, members of the 9th Congressional District, I should say, be more specific, uh, municipalities, city managers, mayors, and council members from the 9th Congressional District. And there were about 20 or 30, 20 or 22, I think, so so um, communities. And the, uh, bear with me. And the, the consensus was that it's not clear whether uh, there's going to be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in lost revenue, but it's it's definitely going to be something staggering for a lot of communities. Uh, so anything we can do to save money right now is going to be something we have to look long and hard at. And especially going forward, we know that we have vulnerabilities uh, to something like this uh, that could happen again. We don't know whether it's gonna come back in the fall or be with us for, for some time, but I can tell you that um, you know I continue to participate in these calls with mayors around the country and the state of Michigan, and uh, they're all working hard on it. What we're working hard on right now is um, the Heroes Act, which is uh, was passed by con was passed by the House of Representatives on Friday of uh, last week, Friday, May fifteenth, I believe, and it would allocate a significant amount of funding to cities like the city of Sterling Heights in order to continue paying for the trash collection, continue paying for police officers and firefighters, continue uh, delivering clean water, uh, continue to uh, pave the streets. You know, we know that revenue sharing is going to be down. We don't know what's going to happen to property values, um, but we have to prepare for that. And there have been a number of, of ways that the federal government has stepped up and helped businesses and helped individuals. And uh, I certainly think that uh, you know it's it's time to to look at municipalities through no fault of our own. Uh, we are going to be seeing significant reductions in revenue, and, and I'm hopeful that uh, that the Senate and the President looks at that carefully and passes something. The Heroes Act would uh, result in about 39 million dollars in revenue for the city of Sterling Heights over the next two years which is uh, an incredibly significant amount of money uh, that we will need. Um, so we're hoping that uh, the Senate, and, and, if, and if you're watching out there, um, you know, I think both the senators from the state of Michigan are on board with this. I've spoken with Senator Peters uh, you know, specifically, and he, and he uh, understands the importance. He's really been a leader at the, um, 
at the Senate for trying to get something for, for municipalities. But you know, if you know friends or family members from other states, uh, please encourage them to look at, uh, at this uh, very closely because municipalities are going to be the next in need. And, you know, um, as we talk about Memorial Day coming up, it is sad. It's one of the one of the days we all look forward to. It's fun for the city council. And I know it's great for our residents to uh, take in the parade and to have the ceremony in the morning. Um, the city's got a week full of activities planned to commemorate the service of those who died in support of our country. And I just want to, before we um, adjourn into closed session, I just want to mention something that I came across in the Detroit News a, a, about a week ago that stopped me in my tracks. It was really shocking. Um, and it, it's hung with me ever since. The family of Namir and Nada Iram, these are Sterling Heights residents um, who were young. They have children aged 20, 18, and 13. And they both died of COVID-19. Within 20 days, a husband and wife, residents of the city of Sterling Heights, leaving a 20 year old, an 18 year old and a 13 year old. And it's just unconscionable, you know, what's happening. And while we all are in our homes and hopefully staying safe and protected, I mean, the council here, it's just shocking what's happening out there. So I wanna thank our firefighters and our police officers, our frontline hospital workers who put their lives on the line for people uh, like this to, to protect them. And it, it doesn't, always, doesn't always work, it doesn't always, help. And to that family, the Iron family that's going through this, I can't imagine their pain. Uh, but I just want to say, uh, if there's any sacrifice you can make, um, it's a minor inconvenience to wear a mask when you go out to the store. It's a minor inconvenience to, you know, to, to not go to that grocery store if you don't need to. It, whatever you can do to help, you might be saving the life of somebody and it, you, you never know. That person might have already had a spouse who died and has children at home who need that person. So um, I know we're doing a great job here in Sterling Heights and in Michigan. I ask you to keep it up. And uh, with that, I just want to say uh, God bless the, the Iron family and the children. Our hearts go out to you. And if there's anything we as a city can do to help, uh, I hope that uh, I'm not just saying that, that the city and the mayor and the council, there's residents, if you know this family, reach out and help. This is tragic. And there's 123 others who have died from this disease in the last 60 days in our city. And uh, anything we can do to support you, please let us know. Council, um, I'm gonna close that portion and I will entertain a motion to adjourn into closed session. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko. Move to adjourn to closed session. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Ziarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarosky? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? Yes. A motion carries 7-0. We will adjourn into closed session. We may be returning. Uh, you can stay on the call if you want, but you will be muted and you will be put into the waiting room. Council, please mute yourself and we will wait in closed session until it's time to begin. Thank you.
Okay, calling this meeting back to order. Council, we need a motion. Mrs. Zarco. Mayor Taylor, resolve to authorize the city manager to execute a settlement in case number 17-000052-AS consistent with the recommendations of the city's legal counsel. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Diarco? Yes. Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Riska. Council, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Mayor Taylor. So moved. It's been moved uh, and support. Moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor, signify. I'm sorry, all in favor, uh, Ms. Riska, roll call vote, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Koski? Yes. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Sarasky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. And Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Okay, motion carries 7-0. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you, Council. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.